So Bitcoin and Ethereum are two of the most popular cryptocurrencies out there. But have you taken the time to look at how they compare, how they're similar and different in a variety of different aspects, like their origin, monetary policy, scripting language, how they handle network upgrades and so forth? Well, if you haven't, then this video is for you, whether you are a newbie or you're someone who's been around the space for a while, but hasn't taken the time to really dive in and compare Bitcoin to Ethereum. And if you want to learn all about this topic, then sit back, relax, and just keep on watching. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin from Bitcoin for Beginners. This channel is all about learning with no frills nor fluff. So this video is a little bit longer than our other ones. So I will leave the timestamps down below for your viewing pleasure. Also, while you're watching this video, if you find anything helpful whatsoever, you can support us by smashing the like button, subscribing down below, hit that notification bell, and let's get started in Bitcoin versus Ethereum. So these two coins have been the top two coins by market cap for the majority of the past few years. Many people like to compare these two projects, but although they have some similarities, they have more differences than similarities. It's kind of like comparing apples to oranges. So let's take a look at all of these. First, a brief look at their similarities. Both use proof of work consensus algorithms right now. And what this means is that you have to invest energy and hardware costs in order to secure the blockchain via mining and hash power per se. BTC and ETH can both be used for P2P transactions. Many software wallets support both of these popular coins. Both projects are also open source with large developer communities. They also have a large global network of independent nodes and are generally deemed as decentralized. But now let's get to the differences, starting with origin. Bitcoin's origin came in 2009 when Satoshi Nakamoto published the white paper. No fundraising was done whatsoever, and miners had to mine on the Bitcoin network to receive the very first Bitcoins. Satoshi himself mined around 1 million Bitcoin, and this is supposed to be the largest amount for any single owner. However, he never spent any and disappeared from the internet without anyone knowing his identity. Ethereum, on the other hand, its origin story happened in 2013 when founder Vitalik Buterin published the Ethereum white paper. An ICO followed in 2014 in which a pre-mined quantity of Ethereum was distributed to investors who mainly invested with Bitcoin. Vitalik Buterin is still actively involved with the Ethereum project and has an influential role of leadership. Other early leaders include Diorio, Hoskinson, Alisi, Lubin, Gavin Wood, and so forth. Now, let's take a look at Bitcoin's use case. It's designed to be a peer-to-peer -peer transfer of value and store of value. It's optimized for that function and nothing else. Bitcoin is also the native currency on the network that facilitates that function. The fee in Bitcoin is for making transactions and that's just based on the data size of each transaction. Ethereum, on the other hand, its native coin is called Ether or ETH. It's not designed to be a digital dollar per se like Bitcoin, but rather fuel for a wide range of transactions and functions. The function of Ether is more of like a utility. You pay a fee to run the code on the network. Ethereum aims to be a decentralized world computer that is distributed in nodes all across the network, and this is called the Ethereum virtual machine. It can host smart contracts on which decentralized apps can use to function, and also it enables tokens like ERC20 tokens with a lot of different functionalities in their own apps. Current notable usages of dApps include decentralized finance, and also gaming. People have also been using Ether as a digital currency, even though that's not its main purpose. Now, in terms of scripting language, Bitcoin keeps it simple. It uses the script language. This keeps the code robust, but also less vulnerable to bugs that the more complex languages face. But on the other hand, this means it can only support simple smart contracts like multi-signature and escrow. More advanced smart contracts on Bitcoin is doable, but they need a second layer solution or a sidechain solution. Now, there are projects working on this, nothing really tangibly implemented yet. But even though Bitcoin can't really handle powerful smart contracts, that's okay because its main focus, and the whole community thinks so as well, is on decentralization, censorship resistance, and security. These are of the utmost importance to the Bitcoin community. Ethereum scripting languages design with its purpose in mind. Ethereum is meant to be a smart contracts and decentralized apps platform. This means it needs to support more complex logic Turing complete is the technical word for it. This means that there can be a more wide range of bugs in its code and harder to find in such an audit. For both the protocol layer 
and the App Slayer. Certain bugs have led to the loss of millions of dollars in Ether or Ethereum tokens. So there is this inherent risk factor, right? But the expectation is that the additional benefits of this powerful logic outweigh the risks. Also, there are methods being developed by the Ethereum space to minimize these risks. So keep that in mind as well. Now let's take a look at monetary policy. The inflation rate of Bitcoin supply is hard coded into the protocol. There will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin in circulation. Currently over 17 million Bitcoin have already been mined and the emission rate is 12.5 Bitcoins per block and with roughly 10 minutes per block, this means 75 Bitcoin produced per hour, roughly speaking. Each four years, the rate is cut in half. This is called the halving or halvening. And in May 2020, the rate will be reduced to 6.25 Bitcoins per block. Bitcoin's monetary policy is considered to be fixed and non-inflationary. Ethereum, on the other hand, is different. It has no max cap set in stone at this moment, but it's occasionally reduced during large network upgrades or forks, per se. There was a recent reduction of 3 to 2 Ether rewards per block. And Ethereum produces a block roughly every 15 seconds. This equates to 480 Ethers per hour. There's no fixed maximum supply for Ethers, so it is infinite in theory, always going up. But do know just a short discussion that in terms of block times, why would you choose something less, like a few seconds compared to Bitcoin, which is like 10 minutes? There are trade-offs between speed and also security and transaction finality. So depending on the use case of your cryptocurrency, there's an optimal line for that lever. In terms of consensus algorithm, Bitcoin's proof of work algorithm is SHA-256. This can be mined by ASICs, or what you see on the right, application-specific integrated circuits. ASICs are meant to do one specific type of computational task, and that's it. That's why they can dominate general purpose chips like CPUs or GPUs. And in the case of Bitcoin ASICs, they're built for mining their algorithm better than anything else. ASICs provide the Bitcoin network with a ton of hash power, and this means the blockchain is extremely secure. It would take a lot, a lot of resources for someone to 51% attack. However, there are some concerns that ASICs lead to decentralization due to the concentration of mining power. However, this is debated and disputed within the community. Ethereum, on the other hand, its proof of work algorithm is called ETHHash, and this is designed to make it hard for ASICs to mine. They make it more accessible to GPUs, what you have in your computer to run graphics per se, to participate in mining. This is more decentralized approach, but arguably less secure. Proof of work does limit the scalability of Ethereum. And if you think about it, the Ethereum virtual machine, this world supercomputer requires a heavy load of transactions and complex logic, right? So the long-term vision has always been to transition to proof of stake consensus algorithm. This means you no longer need energy and heavy hardware to maintain the network. Instead, the expense is virtually simulated by staking Ether to get the right to solve blocks and get the block rewards. Now, a bad actor that produces false blocks will lose their stake, similar to the proof of work bad actors that waste electricity. They lose the money that they spent in the electricity by trying to produce false blocks. There are pros and cons to proof of work and proof of stake outside the scope of this video. But let me just say that for Ethereum, the trade-offs may be acceptable. In terms of Bitcoin's transaction speeds, it has four transactions per second, and the on-chain transaction speed is very limited. This is due to the decentralization of the proof-of-work network. Now, we of course need higher throughput to achieve mass adoption, right? To compete with PayPal or credit card companies such as true peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. Now, Bitcoin's second layer lightning network should enable millions of transactions per second and fit the bill. Ethereum, on the other hand, is a little bit faster at 15 transactions per second, but it does have similar limitations to Bitcoin at the end of the day. They also have solutions in the work like sharding, proof of stake, rating, which is similar to Lightning, and these should massively help increase the network throughput. In terms of network upgrades, or what we know better as forks, most forks in the Bitcoin world are preferably soft forks. This keeps backwards compatibility. This means that nodes do not have to upgrade their software and they will still work fine and the network stays intact. But there are controversial upgrades that do lead to a hard fork. Bitcoin Cash was one case, a split due to the block size and SegWit disagreements. But these are indeed rare in the Bitcoin space. Keeping the protocol backwards compatible is one aspect of remaining decentralized, and that is why it's a focus and priority in the Bitcoin world. Now for Ethereum. Ethereum is often upgraded by hard forks, and this could increase the risk of chain splits because these are not backward compatibles and you have to upgrade. 
Nodes that don't upgrade won't be part of the network. Now, Ethereum does have more centralized leadership and the developer community coordination, so there's more agreement in terms of upgrade decisions. What this means is that hard forks don't usually lead to chain splits in terms of the Ethereum world. Now, in terms of transaction models, Bitcoin has one that's called the Unspent Transactions Output Model, or UTXOs, which you might have seen in various articles around. Now, the Bitcoin blockchain does not keep track of accounts. It only tracks transactions from address to address. So the wallet and node software kind of aggregates the addresses controlled by the same private key. Remember, one private key can control a bunch of different addresses and show the total balance that you have. A wallet usually collects multiple addresses that contain an amount of unspent Bitcoin. So when you make a transaction, you spend the entire amount of those addresses. Now, if spending that amount means that you sent higher than what you really wanted to send, then the remainder is sent to a change address. You can think of this as paying 10 bucks in cash to buy an $8 item and receiving $2 back in change. Now the UTMXO method is built so that it increases the pseudonymous nature of Bitcoin transactions. This means that you are known by your address, but you don't have to give away any part of your identity in order to transact. Now, this does not provide full privacy and anonymity though because of the advent of chain analysis software, which kind of pieces together to do like data science and so forth. Ethereum, on the other hand, uses an account model. This is a much less complex account model and you get one Ethereum address, which works similarly to any account. A user would use one address for everything. Now, of course, you can have two addresses or make a third one as well, but you can use them and continually use them for perpetuity. Wallets do not create new addresses every time there's a new transaction, not for change, not for spending, and so forth. That stuff is in the Bitcoin's UTXO process. This simplified model, however, does equal less privacy and anonymity because the history of the entire user's account is viewable, unlike Etherscan, for example, if the address is tied to a user's identity. Now, what are some final thoughts here? Ethereum and Bitcoin are more different than you might initially expect. This does not mean that we think there's a superiority of one over the other. Most of them have to do with the different applications and use case scenarios. And the difference in design and development also reflect in their different goals. Bitcoin and Ethereum are honestly not even trying to compete, but are rather attempting to service different needs. So as users and investors, it's important to familiarize yourself with their differences and implications so you can make a better decision as to your personal investment goals and what you want to use if you do want to use cryptocurrency for various purposes. Thanks for watching. Let us know your thoughts about Bitcoin versus Ethereum, how they stack up, what are the similarities and differences. As you can see, a lot of differences. If I missed anything, let me know. If you have any thoughts in your mind, let me know and I'll definitely get back to you. This is Kevin. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day and I will catch you guys next time.